This podcast contains strong language and adult themes. Listener's discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to A Page Too Far, the show where each week one of us reads a book and tells the other all about it. Will it be bad? Will it be good? Let's find out. There's a reason I did it that way. Sounds like Cookie Monster went to grad school. (laughs) Or at least elementary school. My name is Jesus Christ. And this is my co-host, Jason Bourne. Jesus Christ. It's Jason Bourne and Jesus Christ. (laughs) Um, how are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing okay. My throat's doing a lot better after that uh my throat's doing worse now. <laughs> that episode and that's why I'm giving you time here cuz I know exactly how that felt. <laughs> uh so before we begin, we have feedback from a listener. We do. We do. All right, we have feedback from faithful listener All Seeing Eye. He corrected us a little bit. Well, not not corrected as much as just gave the correct answer to something that we suspected. Right. We called the Texas Israeli War 1999 future fiction. And there is a technical term for it. Uh, That technical term includes the definition future fiction, but it is speculative fiction. Yes. Which has to do with the context of supernatural futuristics uh, or other imaginative realms of fiction. Much better term. Yes. (laughs) Speculative fiction. Speculative fiction. It makes makes a lot of sense. So thank you all seeing eye for that. Uh, If you do have any other feedback, uh, any, any listener, please let us know through Instagram, Gmail, anything. We'll take it. So I've got a little bit of a story to tell you. It's a story of hope, of desperation, yep. despair, mm-hmm. Lots and, of despair, and eventual redemption. We'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see about that. But the, the, so this past week, I had to read a book, right? Yeah. I started reading a book, got a chapter in, and it was terrible and not in a fun way. Mm-hmm. It was very boring, very dry, nothing to talk about. So I switched gears. I started another book. That book... I got about a chapter, two chapters in, was actually just a fantastic book. And there, I couldn't think of anything to make fun of or really right. talk about. So I was like, I don't really want to do this either. So <laughs> I, I, got, I picked up a book that's been on my wish list for a while. Um, it, I read it. I read the whole thing. Yes. It was about 200 pages. We did the episode. We recorded a full episode. We recorded a full a episode. A multiple hour episode. It was over two hours. And... At the end, we decided it was too graphic to upload. We're recording this episode days later, and I still, I have showered multiple times <laughs> since that recording, and I still feel like I need a shower. It, it, yeah, it, uh, a weird thing has happened to me. I, I feel like I'm only remembering the things that were interesting and nice about it, and I'm forgetting all the bad things. Oh, good. You're, 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 uh, uh, what's I've that moved called? on, I guess. You're suppressing. I'm or suppressing one of those things. But I, I was just thinking today, I was like, ah, oh, that was such like a, a beautifully poetic way of no. laying out that. No, scene. it wasn't. <laughs> No, nothing about that book was beautiful or poetic. I thought it was, well, I mean, I thought it was absolutely poetic. It's just, you have to have read it, right? I, yeah, I didn't read it, to be fair. So, it's absolutely poetic. It's just the most depraved shit I've ever read. <laughs> so, it was, it, it was, it was past our deadline for having a recorded episode. Right. And we were like, let's push it to, to Sunday. Let's push it off a few days. Pick another book. I, I was like, okay, I have a book that I've had since... Since since I bought Time Blender, so I bought Time right. Blender with two other books. Right. So I had this other book on the bottom of the stack, and I was like, "It's not that long. I've already read a few pages in. I think this is a good one. I'm gonna start reading." Over the days, I realized I wasn't gonna finish the book on time. Yep. So out of absolute desperation, which honestly, and may I go on record as saying, I don't blame you one bit because we did push this back. Yes. Like <laughs> like this this is. We have not stuck to our normal schedule. This is my fifth book for yes. one week. Yes. <laughs> so out of desperation, and I want to say that I wanted this, the books we pick to be organic. Right. Meaning that I go out to a bookstore and I look through random books until I find something that interests me. But I resorted to Google mm-hmm. and I Googled interesting books, which I've done in the past, but th- those have been on the back burner in case of emergency. My f- my first book was a Google book. So I just looked for a book that was interesting and short. Yeah. And this was very short. And I thought it was kind of interesting. And it has a history. So that's why I chose this book. Yeah. And 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 that is perfectly okay for this show. I mean, we we try to keep things organic, but we also 
we want to stick to the schedule more and upload upload good episodes yeah. more than forcing out content. Yeah, and it also it's just it can't be helped. We're gonna run into duds. Yeah, exactly. Not not every book is good. Not every book is bad. But also, not every book is noteworthy or or yeah. easily talked about. A book can be fantastic, but if there's nothing for us to work with, right? We're not gonna do it. <laughs> right. There the uh uh. I don't I don't remember if I went into detail on it on our last episode. Maybe you can remind me. But um, the Orphans of the Sky episode that I did was my second attempt at a book because the first book that I read most of played like an action movie, which was entertaining to read, mm-hmm. but would have been terrible to talk about because it's just this main character being a badass. Right. Yeah. And nothing happening. Right. So so sometimes it just it doesn't work out. and We have to switch gears. Yeah. And it's stressful. <laughs> It's very stressful, but you know what? It's a lot of fun, though. This week's book is called The Eye of Argon. Oh. And I read the Scholar's Edition ebook. Okay. That's it. That's important. Okay. The Eye of Argon is written by Jim Thies. Is it T-H-E-E-S? Uh, E-I-S. E-I-S. Okay, but it's Thies, not, not like with an F. I looked it up because I wasn't sure. And nice. from what I found, it's Thies. So okay. Jim Thies. Uh, it's a fantasy novel. Okay. I mean, I guess it's the title of a Magic the Gathering card. <laughs> uh, it was really. So the, the book I read was like published because the, the full title of the book was The Eye of Argon Scholar's Edition ebook. And I think that was published. The book itself was published in like 2011 or something. Okay. Th- there's been multiple publications of this story. Sure. Uh, I, I don't remember. If you just Google that, I'm sure you'll come up with the latest, whatever the ebook is I bought. I'm too lazy to look it up right now, but. Anyways, it, the story was originally written in 1970. Oh, okay. Okay. It's pretty old, but it keeps getting published with people, usually critics or authors, writing essays about it and snapping it on the end. Oh, I see. So the the, the version I bought had three essays attached to it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which was uh, more than twice the story itself, the, like lengthwise. Uh, you, know, you know the book Anthem by Ayn Rand? I've heard of that. About I, it. uh, it's one of my all time favorite sci-fi books, but, um, we had to read it in school and I bought a copy of it. That was maybe 250, 300 pages. Uh-huh. And what I didn't realize when I bought it was the version that I bought had the editor's notated edition attached to it. So it was the book and then the book again, but with all those little, like cross out this sentence, you don't need this, rewrite this. Right. So the actual book itself was a third of what the actual page right. count was i was thrilled when i found that out because it was a school assignment <laughs> but that was i i don't understand what who goes and reads those the essays I mean, maybe i can understand the, in this case i think it was pretty interesting um because this story has quite a history okay uh but i want to redo the story first not redo the story but uh, explain the story summarize it yes and at the end we'll talk about it okay I, I want you to get the unadulterated story first all right okay so let's jump into it The Eye of Argon. We begin the book with our protagonist, Grigner, the Barbarian. That's why I was (laughs) screaming earlier. You've seen Galaxy Quest. Uh, A long time ago. Grignac. 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 I don't remember that part. It's it's a rock monster that Tim Allen fights. Nice. It's a, oh, so it's like a parody of uh, Captain Kirk fighting the lizard thing. Okay. That's great. I gotta rewatch that movie. So we join our protagonist, Grigner the Barbarian, in the middle of a battle with mercenaries who are after the bounty on his head. Ooh. Uh, Grigner is big, muscular, and has flaming red hair. Bigner. Uh, He's equipped with a broadsword and shield. No soul, though. No (laughs) soul. No soul. And he's fighting on horseback. (laughs) After dispatching the mercenaries, he resumes his journey to the Norigolian city of Gorzam. I love these names. These are some top tier fantasy names. There's going to be a quiz at the end of this, so remember all that. Okay, okay. It's not important at all, but remember it. Once in the city, so he's journeyed there. Uh, once in the city, Grigner looks for a whore. As one does. He's a barbarian. It's a very barbarian thing yeah. to do. I know a certain uh, half giant who would love <laughs> love that, and he would also like to rage. Soon enough, he finds one in a, in a tavern. And is fondling her when a drunken soldier kicks a cup of wine out of his hand. He's fondling her and has a cup of wine in his hand. Yeah, he reaches for it. And then as soon as he picks it up, guy kicks it out of his hand. You should really, I mean, 
if you see a redheaded barbarian yeah. who's wearing a loincloth, don't do that. With a girl. Yeah, don't. Just don't. <laughs> that's, that's a big mistake. Yeah. Grigner immediately decapitates the soldier. As, as they expected. And then he's arrested by the soldier's comrades. For decapitating said soldier. Right. And he's brought before the ruling noble. Who's Jokes on him, dead guy wins, but he's also dead. Yeah, he's dead. So uh, he's brought before uh, the ruling noble of the city, which is a, a prince. And he's a really flabby, fat, petulant piece of shit. Right? Yeah. Uh, the prince demands that Grigner kneel before him, but Grigner declines to do so, uh, calling him a fat fool. Uh, one of the soldiers strikes Grigner in the face with the flat of his blade. The prince sentences Grigner to death. But after a word from his advisor, Agafnd. How do you spell that? A-G-A-F-N-D. I, I think you did a fantastic job. <laughs> Agafnd. Agafnd. After a word from his advisor, Agafnd. Agafnd backwards is Jafar. He instead sentences him to a life of labor in the mines. Oh, nice. And the, the author refers to them as the Stygian pits. Stygian is a word I've heard before. Related to the underworld. Yes. Like the river Styx. Yes. The author uses the word Stygian about 20 times in this novella, and only three of them actually make sense. Hmm. Okay? <laughs> the, the author uses a lot of words that don't fit. and But they sound dope. And he also, <laughs> he also makes up words. Um, I mean, all the best authors do. We'll get to that later, but there's some great made-up words. I cannot wait. Grigner makes a play uh, to escape, and he kills the guards immediately close to him, uh, but then is knocked unconscious from behind, right? Is this is this in the mines, or is this in the... No, in the, right in front of the prince. Okay. Yep. Grigner wakes up in a pitch-black stone room uh, that he guesses is underneath the palace. Yeah, it makes sense. He's in a cell now. So now we're going to cut away from Grigner... Because this story takes uh, place in two perspectives. It dovetails. Yep. So uh, we're going to cut away from Grigner, and it's uh, now to someone else. So a group of shamans are standing around a marble altar chanting. In front of the altar is a hideous jade idol of their deity, Ooh. right? Like this whole book just drips of perfect D&D campaigns. Oh, yeah. It's just beautiful. The cycloptic deity's name is Argon. Oh. So Argon has a single eye. He right? does. A beautiful, fair-skinned maiden sits naked, cowering under the gaze of the idol. Uh-huh. Cultus, got a beautiful naked girl, altar, idol. Yeah, I mean, classic. Classic. Grigner is unable to measure... Oh, fuck, we cut back. I didn't put stuff to mark that we jumped to and fro. I just wrote it down. So back to Grigner. Grigner is unable to measure time in his bare stone cell. There's no windows, there's... There's someone who brings him food every now and then, yeah. but it seems inconsistent. Um, but he estimates he's been in prison for a few days at least. He had scrutinized every block in the walls and floor, but could not find a way out. Suddenly, he hears a scratching noise near the far wall that sounds like an animal's claws. Now a few feet from the source of the noise, so he's walking towards it, Yep. a furry and ferocious giant rat jumps on his chest and goes for his throat. Grigner struggles with the rabid beast until finally twisting off its head. Ew. As I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. But... You gotta survive, man. Yeah. As the barbarian is licking his wounds, inspiration strikes, and he begins digging through the rat's corpse. He's got an idea. Okay. One of the shamans, back to them again, sorry, okay. <laughs> hopping really fast, I'm not giving you a warning here. One of the shamans tells the woman to step to the altar, but she begins crying and kneels on the floor. Women, am I right? The priest lifts her up, and it says, with his ape arms. Oh. Gross. Yeah. Uh, and he kisses her on the cheek, which causes her to wrench her head back and puke on his rich purple robes. Oh, wow. Because he's a, he's a very foul person. Seems like it. The priest grips her throat with his ape-like hands. Oh, yeah, I did write it down there. With his ape-like hands, and he begins strangling her. Nice guy. Uh, desperately, she kicks him in the balls. <laughs> That's the classic move. I've got to say, if you're in the business of forcing women to do something they don't want to do, wear a cup. Yeah. Like, yeah, it should be obvious. <laughs> like, it's a work hazard. Because women, if women feel threatened, they're going for your balls. That's the off switch. Or the on switch, <laughs> depending on what you're doing. Joke's on you. I'm into that. <laughs> um, the priest collapses in agony. The other shamans were aghast. Never had they seen such an act of blasphemy from a chosen one before. 
Nobody's ever, no sacrificial I mean, victim has ever kicked a priest in the balls before. I mean, bruh. Really? Uh, <laughs> how long have they been doing this? I don't this, know. This is, just, this is their first one. This is their first time? Yeah, like, we've never oh, seen this man, before. This is new. What do we do with this? Uh, so the rest of them just sees her and she passes out from terror. Okay. So we're going to cut back to Grigner. And I put a lot of question marks in my notes because I read and reread this part and I still don't get it. Oh. A prison guard throws a length of rope into the pit. Okay. That Grignor is in. He's in a pit. Yeah. Before he was in a windowless cell. So I'm not sure I got to a pit, but he's in a pit now. And a guard throws a length of rope down for him to climb out. There's got to be a better system. That doesn't seem like a great system. No, if you're starving your prisoners and they can't, what happens if they just can't get out? Or what happens if like they get to the top of the pit and push you in? Like, yeah, or it's literally just, any of the complications. This, yeah, have. this is just a bad system. Yeah. I also put a question mark here because I wasn't sure exactly, I wasn't sure exactly what Grigner did with the rat, but I, from what I gathered, he got a rib bone from the rat and splintered it so it's a sharp uh, shiv, right? Okay. And he has it tucked, it says literally has it tucked in his G-string. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and um, so when he gets to the top, he stabs one of the guards with it uh, and then disarms the other guard and then strangles him. Oh. Okay. He's free now. Yeah. So there's there was a couple moments in this scene that I wanted to bring up because th- this is highlighting really inappropriate terms and made up words. Okay. Do go on. So in this scene... Uh, there's a sentence, and part of the sentence is ejaculating a curse through gritted teeth. <laughs> That's a correct usage of the word. You should have used a different word. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, technically so, correct, I guess. This is this is off topic a, a little bit, but I've been reading uh, Sherlock Holmes, the, the Sherlock Holmes novels, yeah. um, just because I've never actually read all of them. So right. I'm, I'm going through them. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uses that phrase a lot. Really? Usually in regarding to Watson. <laughs> it's usually uh uh how did you do that i ejaculated oh i yes yeah no th- totally um yeah totally yeah it, it, when you say it that way it, it actually sounds better than what this is well no it doesn't i think well <laughs> i i prefer that over ejaculating a curse <laughs> i think either way that's it's... some some people would say that's what a kid is it's just an ejaculated curse <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for this and more, tune into our Patreon. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. And he also makes up words. So I wrote one word down. Okay. The word he uses in, in a part of the book is atmosphere. Atmosphere. I looked it up. It's not a word. In the context, it was a dank, moist place. So I think he, he combined atmosphere and moisture together to make atmosphere. Yes. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, there's another word, which is probably my new favorite word Ooh. that's taken place of omphaloskepsis. Mine's still bubble. And uh, that is expugnissively. Expugnissively. Expugnif- is Yeah, expugnissively. It's also, also not a word. <laughs> How does one do something expugnissively? I don't know. And the context didn't really help me to understand. <laughs> That's just the, was what it is. So whatever you want it to mean, I guess. Huh. Grignar begins sneaking through the dark passageways under the palace. Ooh. He's a rogue now. Uh, he he is a, a cross class. Uh, they call him a barbarian thief. Oh. So dope. he, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I, I could be wrong about this, but I think thief was the original class in oh, really? D&D. I don't think it was rogue. I think it was thief. That makes sense. I'm going to fact check because we're going to get letters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There were only three main classes at first, the cleric, the fighting man, and the magic user, but the first supplement added the thief as a fourth main class, Mm. as well as a paladin. Uh, So he's sneaking around in the dark passageways. Eventually, he comes upon a door, and he puts his ear against it, but he doesn't hear anything. Hark. Uh, The herald angel sings? Yeah, but hark means listen. He tries to open the door, but it won't budge. It's locked, I guess. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, something like that. Man, if only you had a... Thief. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) He places the blade of an axe that he picked off off one of the guards into the crack of the door. Oh, I I really thought you were going to say into the lock and I was picturing that and that just didn't work. (laughs) That would have been great. (laughs) Like just how that would have been hammers it in. That would have been better because he's got a 20 strength. 
he levers the door open with the blade somehow. I don't know how, but he does. <laughs> I'm picturing it, and it's not picturing. Also an axe. That's a big-ass crack in the door. Like, axes are... An axe crack? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, get out. <laughs> get out. Um, Unless it's one of those doors that has the, uh, like, not a deadbolt lock, but the kind of lock that... I don't, I don't know what it's called, but it's like most office doors have them where they open and latch by sliding into place and clicking in. And if you use like a credit card, you can put the flat surface in yeah. and push the thing in. I definitely haven't done this before. <laughs> um, it could be. Yeah. It could be. Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure. He just pushed, pushed it in, turned the handle. It doesn't say he opened the lock. It just says he pried the door open. And it, it implies by brute force. That's a very strong accent. Yeah, and and I I mean I don't know what the door's made of. It doesn't to say be torqued I, that maybe way. Maybe wood, I guess. Particle board. <laughs> you just spit on it; it starts dissolving. <laughs> uh, so the room beyond uh, seems to be just a simple storage space. Hmm. Uh, but he does a little bit of investigating, trying to find something useful. Yeah, he's a thief for fuck's sake. Uh, so he hears a ticking sound, and oh. and he he narrowly avoids a death trap. The description of the death trap is very, very confusing, and he he says it's like a catapult. Okay, but it's a it it kicks a floorboard up at him. Oh, like somebody walking and stepping on a rake. Kind kind of, but I don't I don't know. It's it's confusing. But or it lifts it up and shoots it at him like horizontally. Maybe it, it's, it's going to click him in the teeth. And it's very vague on how the the trap works. Yeah, but it mentions twice that it looks like a catapult, and it dislodged a floorboard so that he could see underneath. Yeah, well, that's okay. the important thing. So uh, below, uh, he sees another chamber. Uh, so he gets a torch and climbs down. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a mausoleum. Ooh. He's surrounded by crypts. Don't say it. Don't fucking say it. I, mean, I made this joke in our last episode. <laughs> you did. But that episode's not going to come out. It will maybe eventually. It might come out. It might come out on Patreon at some point. Maybe it'll be a Halloween special. There we go. We'll there we go. For Halloween. If you want to hear the most disgusting episode we've ever recorded for Halloween, let us know. <laughs> so uh, Grigner can see the trap that he'd sprung, and it's like mounted on the ceiling. So oh. it's mounted on the ceiling, kicked up a floorboard in yeah. the next room. Very elaborate. It's very weird, and I'd feel bad for the regular dudes that were just going to the storage room and forgot that there was a trap in the floor. Well, maybe. I mean, that is that is always the trope, right? Is how do the evil minions get to work? Right. <laughs> so uh, Grigner decides to reset the trap. Nice. So that uh, it says so that there would be no evidence of his passing. Except the door you pried Except off. Except for him. the busted door and the dead guards yeah. and all of that shit. The fact that you're not where you're supposed to be. Uh, but then he's also like, oh, and in case anyone goes in there, I might as well kill somebody. Yeah. What's it? I mean, just. Just a little carnage. It's fine. Yeah. He's all about carnage. He loves I'm sure. it. I'm um, sure. His favorite Spider-Man villain. So he is startled uh, by a scream coming from one of the sarcophagus. Uh, the sarcophagi? One of the sarcophagi. Yeah. It, it's coming from there. So he opens it up, but it's just a rotting corpse. Uh, and then he hears it again. And eee! he's like, oh, no, it's under the body. Oh. So he throws the body out. And he sees like a hinged door Mm -hmm. where the body was sitting. And so he opens it up and he sees a beautiful woman lying naked on an altar surrounded by robed men. Ooh, this is the unnamed heroine from before. Yeah. Grigner jumps into the room with a battle cry. Yeet. It, it, (laughs) the the author very colorfully paints a picture that Grigner was prompted into battle by her tits. Okay. He saw a beautiful woman. Yeah. And he was he said he felt a fire in his soul. This was written in the 70s, I believe it. Right. So <laughs> so he jumps in and all of the robed men start like shrieking. And they're like, "Oh my god, there's a dude with a torch and an axe and he looks barbaric." Would you say he's trying to free the titty? <laughs> well, I mean, they're free. They're pretty free. No, they're being surrounded by cultists. But not by fabric. <laughs> Let the joke play. <laughs> okay, fine. So uh, they're all startled uh, by this, and one of them starts foaming at the mouth, and falls over, convulsing. What? Just because he's scared? I guess. Okay. He's really scared. Grigner makes short work of the shaman. Nice. 
And then he looks at the idol, which has wholly taken his attention. Ooh. He kind of forgot about the woman on the altar, which oh, is funny because that was his reason for entering. Yeah, but this idol's, I assume, magic of some sort. Of some sort. Uh, so looking at the idol, he notices there's a very large red emerald on the forehead of the idol. Would you say it's where its second eye would be? Uh, or its only eye, because it's... Well, it's the third eye, but... Cy- well, it's cycloptic. Oh, so this isn't this isn't the actual eye. This or this is the actual eye. It is this the isn't eye. above the eye. I was picturing like where the the Hindu. Oh third yeah, no, eye not is. not that quite. This it's is a, just the actual eye. It just has like one big eye, and it's okay. a, it's a red emerald. See, right? that was a layered joke there, right? Because it, I thought it had the eye, and then that was above it where its third eye would be, but it only has one eye, so it would be its second eye. That'd be better, I think. But that joke didn't work out because I was just wrong. It you were was, just wrong. It was based on an incorrect premise. <laughs> so I did make that clear. Um... <laughs> So the woman begins begging Grigner to help her escape. Yeah, as you do. And uh, he's like, oh, shit, you're the whore from the tavern. What? Okay. That he was groping earlier. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, so he picks her up off the altar. And I knew she, I recognized those titties. And uh, she puts her arms around his neck. Save me. Uh, Yee! Oh, and he also took the red emerald out of the statue. I forgot that. But he uh, plucked that out, put it in his pocket. Okay, so he yoinks the eye. Takes yep. the girl, makes his way out. Exactly. Uh, and so they go to the door, and uh, there's a whole bit about how there's a hidden panel with a mechanism, and Grigner's too stupid to figure it out, so the girl figures it out. It's um, very deep. But he, <laughs> where did this come from? I don't know. It, it was really random, and it didn't he was matter. Perfectly competent with the other trap. It, it's I mean, it, when. It, it, I don't know. It, the way it's written, he finds the panel, finds he the rolled, mechanism. He rolled a nat one. That's what it was. He, <laughs> he finds the mechanism, and it said uh, the armor would not yield to his might. I don't know what he was trying to do with it, but he gave up after rolling a strength check. Yeah. So she figures it out, because I guess she saw a shaman do it or something. I don't know. It's not explained. Eh. Oh, God. I completely forgot about this. There's a line when he first picks her up. Oh, okay. Because he smooches her. Okay. Without consent. Does he say you you could use some gum? <laughs> she had just puked on the older cultist. Oh, that, well, I mean, that was like five minutes earlier, though. <laughs> Her breath still stank. She could have had some Listerine handy. We don't know. She might have had breath mint. Could be. Um, so the, <laughs> it literally says... He smothered her trim, delicate lips between the coursing protrusions of his reeking maw. It's like those people who have a dog and they like put their mouth over the dog's nose. Yes, it's gross. Fucking hell. Her chin disappears. Just the the book is full of language like this where it's just like, yeah, like, yes, those are words and those words make sense in that context. But why would you use them? Yeah, it's like, why? Why? It's why it's very confusing. Um, The book is also filled with typos. Oh, like bad typos. Like a word is printed twice. Wow. Or literally there was a word that was a pawn, but it had an H, an R, and then it had like a space J. It's a prawn mite. It's, it's, it was weird. So, uh, Grigner asks the wench once they get the door open, yeah. uh, if she can find her way out. And she says, yes, I used to be one of the prince's concubines, but I, oh. I had escaped, but I know my way around. So he's like, cool, let's, let's go. Is she uh, just hanging out in a tavern nearby? Yeah, not very smart, I guess. No, not at all. Grigner asks her what her name is, and she says it's, I don't know if it's Carthina or Carthina. I'm going to go with Carthina. Okay, so her name is Carthina, uh, and then she asks what his name is. But the way, okay, God, the way it's phrased is, again, really weird uh, and also hilarious because it says, uh, what is your calling? She queried bustily. (laughs) <laughs> just asking him tits first yeah I don't, I don't know how you ask somebody bustily like is she like tapping out morse code with her press or something she's just hand boning her tits um <laughs> i'd be impressed there's the i just just this just, just, this this calls to mind so many gags from so many movies yeah. this this whole book so far has because you had galaxy quest here you have, uh, is it Wild Wild West with Will Smith? Oh, yes. They're filled with sand, so they feel like real titties. Yeah, but they're but sometimes they just can't help themselves because he's from Africa and they, they play the drums and that's what they do. That's the excuse that he gives. 
I don't when remember he does that. it. He gives <laughs> he gives that so he drums on uh some girl's titties. Yeah. Because he thinks it's the other guy dressed as a girl because that yeah. happened earlier. Okay. And so there, she screams and slaps him, and then they're going to hang him. And he says, no, 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 wait. It's okay, because I'm from Africa. And what do Africans do? We drum. It's fine. And That's, Will, Will Smith chose to do that. Will Smith did that. I remember there's a lot of racist humor in that yes, film. Yes, it's horrible. I still love the giant robot spider. But The robot spider was very interesting, and was it was Kenneth Branagh, right? I don't remember. I think it was Kenneth Branagh was the, the, the spider head man. Uh, Grigner tells her his name, says, I'm Grigner of uh, Eridokusa or something like that. I didn't write that one down. It was weird. Um, As Grigner opens the heavy door into the passageways beyond, he is so engrossed in her company that he fails to hear the rapid footsteps behind him. He rolled another nat one. Yeah, This time it was on perception. Not doing good. A bloodlusted screech hits his ears. Uh, Grignor, I keep saying Grignor, but it's Grigner. Grignor sounds better. Is it N E R? No, yeah. it is G R I G N R. Grigner. Interesting. Yeah. Grigner turns and raises his axe above his head. Uh, it was one of the cultists. It was, in fact, the cultist that had passed out convulsing. Oh. I guess he woke up and came after him. No. A loud snap rings out, and the acolyte is killed by a trap. This is another part that just I didn't understand very well. It it just says there was a snap and a, a catapult that killed him, but it doesn't explain really. In my mind, it just yeeted him into the ceiling. Uh, I from from the image I got is that so they're in the doorway. Yeah. The cultist is coming at him straight on, mm-hmm. and then there's something on the opposite wall that triggers when you get when you go through the doorway, and it and shot it passed sh- between them. Right, so it shoots a bolt him. or something and okay. hit him in the back. That's the way I interpreted it, but it was not clear at all. It it literally it was like two lines, like the trap triggered and killed him. Bam. Again, how do you get to work? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. This is just not good. Uh, this is not up to code. As they move through the tunnels toward the secret exit. That uh, Carthena told him about. Mm-hmm. Grigner hears a set of footsteps up ahead and hides with Carthena in the shadows of the passage. Ooh, in the shadows to the left. Yes. Um, and it's this passage is described as being really gross. There's like skeletons chained up to the walls and shit. Grody, the torture chamber. Something like that. So as they're hiding in the shadows, they hear these two men uh, come forward. And uh, you can hear the conversation. And it's something about raising taxes and punishing peasants and evil, 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 evil. Uh, so Grigner jumps out and buries his axe in one of the men's heads. It was a Gaffend, the, the advisor. Oh. And then the other draws a knife and goes to stab Grigner. As, and, yeah. And Grigner cuts off his hand. There you go. And Carthena lunges forward with a shriek and buries the torch in his face. Eee! And she had just killed a Gaffin, the prince. We didn't mention his name before, but his name is a Gaffin. So there's a Gaffin and a Gaffend. Yeah. I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, they have very similar names. Interesting. <laughs> I legit didn't notice that. Interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, they killed the prince and his advisor. That's well, nice. All their troubles are over now. Yeah, that's uh, that's when the DM just wants to go home. And yeah. he's like, ah, oh, they come walking down the, the, the hallway. <laughs> Do it. You won't. <laughs> Let's get this over with and move on so I can go watch TV. The tunnel led them to a corral outside the palace. Some horses in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sun was just rising over the horizon. It's morning now. Uh, Grigner raises the red emerald towards the sun. He's kind of gloating to Carthena. Oh, that's right. We have this. Yeah, and he's like holding it up to the sun. And he's like, ah, I'm so manly and you're so beautiful and we escaped and we'll be rich forever. That's basically what he says. Yeah. Uh, but he's a barbarian. What the fuck does he give about ri- I mean, he's a thief, but he's, I don't know. He's a barbarian. He doesn't have any riches. Fish got to swim. Birds got to eat. She exclaims, the eye of Argon! And then she lets out what I assume is a curse. It's a random word that isn't explained. So I guess she she says E again. The gem begins glowing. Ooh, uh uh-oh. And then melts into a slimy red ooze that slips through Grigner's fingers and lands on the ground. Eat it. It's purple flirt. The ooze transforms into a pulsating jelly-like mass, which forms a maw. He's carrying a congealed weapon. And begins sliding towards Grigner. So it's a, I guess it's a 
fucking what are they called? It's like a classic an ooze. It, I guess or a mimic. There's a no. There's a um. There's a fucking video game that introduced like little blob thing that was like infamous. It was in the the Cuphead game. It was one of the first bosses. I played Cuphead for the first level. Okay, I don't. Whatever. It, it's a little ooze, right? Uh, and it starts moving towards him. Grigner slams the blade of his axe into the blob, but it just passes straight through and sticks in the ground. It's a blob. Yeah, it's a blob. You can't do it, dumb barbarian. Uh, the blob engulfs his leg, and he can feel the blood and life force being drained from his body. Mm-hmm. With each pucker, the thing grows larger in size. With each pucker? That's the word he used. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's you kind of it's like pulsing, like it's drinking. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> like that. It's a leech. Exactly. It's very. It's described as being very leech-like. Grigner tries with all of his might to tear the thing from his leg, but to no avail. It just his hands just slick yeah. around it and all yeah. that. Uh, as he is starting to lose consciousness in desperation, he plunges the torch into the thing. Ooh! The blob shudders and lets out a hideous gurgling, uh, shrieking noise. Yeah. <laughs> the blob plops to the ground and evaporates until it shrinks to its original size. Oh. It now takes the shape of a red eyeball glaring at Grigner. It quivers and then shatters into a thousand tiny fragments that is swallowed into the earth. Horrifying. Now, this is the greatest statement, in my opinion, of the whole book. I can't wait. It's at the very end. And it says, all that remained was a dark red blotch upon the face of the earth, blotching things up. <laughs> I feel like the author was just buttoning it up, finishing it all up, and then he was like, I don't know how to end this sentence. How do you? It's just blotching things up. How do you describe the blotch? Well, it's very blotchy. <laughs> and it, it just be doing what blotches do. Just blotching up our plans, just, you know? I mean, blotches be blotching. Grigner and Carthena mount a horse and ride off into the sunrise. Nice. The end. What? That's the end. <laughs> I told you it was short. You did tell me it was short, but I also thought that it would have a complete plot. No, of course not. This is the Eye of Argon. <laughs> and that was the Eye of Argon. Okay, so let's go into like the actual history. Yeah, I'm so curious because... <laughs> so Is it part of a series? No, it was a short story written for... What's called a fanzine. Do you know what a fanzine is? Not by name. It is a fan-made magazine. Oh, okay. Makes sense. Very simple. Uh, it was made for a fanzine uh, as a short story. It was written by Jim Thies in 1970. Yeah. He was 16 years old when he wrote this. So he's horny. He's horny, and it explains everything. Yep, a little bit. And he sent it in to a, a fanzine, mm-hmm. and they published his story. Right? What was this fanzine for? We'll get to that. Okay. So Jim Thies yeah. was a mythical figure for like 30 years because he didn't exist as far as anyone could tell. This story just materialized. Under the name Jim Thies. And nobody knows where it came from. They couldn't even find the original magazine it was in. Interesting. There was no evidence that it was written in earnest. By a person named Jim Thies. So it became infamous among critics and authors and fans of fantasy and science fiction. Sure. And for something like 20 years, it was just passed around by critics and and authors as just a big inside joke. And they were like, ah, we've got the Eye of Argon. And they would literally have parties where they would do readings of the, the book Nice. In its original form. And they would play games. And these games would be like, uh, you would have to read a chapter out of the book without smiling or laughing or falling over. Okay. Okay. So like actual party games. Yes. That's very interesting. It was the focus of party games of authors and critics for like two decades. And nobody else knew about it. And nobody knew where it came from. Right. There was a lot of different stories about people that were like, oh, I found it from this person, and it was a photocopy of the original pages or something. But every lead they chased down just ended up being like either wrong or just they can't find the person. That's or, incredible. It, it was this mythical bad book that just came out of nowhere. And I say book, but it's really, really short. It's a short story. So yeah, book yeah, in yeah. quotation marks. And so every time this gets published... 
they're, they add on like an essay of an author or a critic who tried their damnedest to figure out the mystery. Okay. And so they, they make an essay on their progress. And they're like, well, I've traced it up to this point, but no farther. I guess we still don't know. And then with the next publication, another person would add on an essay and yeah. say, I've traced it a little bit further. And it went on like that until like 2011 when this was published, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. And so the guy, there, there's three essays at the end of this. Right. Uh, two of them are what this editor considered the most like progressive out of all of them. Okay. He's like, these guys gave us the most info to go on. Right. These are and the then he added his essay as a conclusion. The editor the, did. Yes. The editor okay. like of the whole thing. And he's like, we figured it out. So yeah, for years it was just this urban legend. And a lot of people believed it was a professional author that was just playing a trick on everybody. Right. But yeah, that's what I would assume. Yeah. Cause some people are like, some of the mistakes are way too obvious. Like it's Stephen Hawking. Yeah, it's it's some it's someone who's brilliant. You mean Stephen King? No. Okay. <laughs> Stephen Hawking just tricking a bunch of people in his spare time with really badly written fantasy. What does what does a scientist want more than to write poorly written fantasy novels? <laughs> uh, so yes, yes, I meant Stephen King. So that was a very that was a very popular theory. A lot of people were like, "This was obviously written by a professional author who is just trying to trick everyone, thinking this is actually just you know bad literature." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that that's just what it was for a long time until this one guy came along and started doing some detective work. Ooh. He finally found Jim Thies. He was a real person. Okay. And they found him because he was a regular at a convention. Oh. A, a fantasy convention, right? Yeah. And I think when he was doing some digging, he found someone who recognized the name. And they're like, Jim Thies, yeah, he's here like every year was, for the past like 30 years. Was the name Necronomicon? No, <laughs> I don't. That's my favorite convention. I don't remember the, I don't know if he actually says the name. Of the, I'm sure he does. I just, I don't remember what the name of the convention was. I wonder if there's a Necrocomicon. There definitely is. There absolutely is. Probably. Um, so he, he finally finds the guy and he's just been like, he hasn't been doing anything. He he's didn't just a guy. realize that he was that. Yeah. He was just a guy. And so he finds them and he asks them all sorts of questions, does interviews with them. And the guy was like, oh, yeah, I when I was a teenager, I fancied myself a writer. So I wrote a short story. I sent it to this magazine. And then I never heard anything back. Well, he, 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 has, he has a little bit to say because he was like, um, I was very, very proud because who else do you know is, you know, 16 and got their story published yeah, in a magazine. Sure. But he was like, I knew it was not a good story. Okay. And I never felt like writing ever again. Solid. So according to him, he just wrote a story, got it published, and then decided that was really not that good. Uh, you know, this isn't for me. I'm going to do something else. Yeah. And he had no idea that it was this holy grail to famous authors and critics around the world. That's hilarious. And in, in it, his book was being read at parties and at like events and stuff. And it was just this, it was this like inside joke to the higher echelon. I can just imagine the editor being like, oh, no, no, don't get me wrong. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he definitely asked him about that. And he, he just straight up says, he's like, look, I was 16. I didn't know how to write. Yeah, for sure. He's, he's like completely self-aware. He's like, oh, yeah, it was garbage. Yeah, no, I don't expect anyone to take anything seriously about it. Yeah. The only 16-year-old I know that wrote a book that was like any good, the book itself was just a copy of Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, like, a teenager's not going to write a, anything that's good, obviously. It's especially Aragon by Christopher Paolini. Check it out. Especially, um, especially a first work of fiction. The oh, yeah. first thing he wrote. Yeah. No, there, there's a, there's a, I don't know if it's an actual rule that exists, but there's a, a theoretical rule uh, that says it takes three books before you're actually competent. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Um, and so he, he was just a fan of fantasy. And that's what he wrote about and then decided not to write again. And so the, the magazine that it was published in was called Oz Fan, I think. I don't, I don't remember what that stands for, but it's like O-S-F-A-N, uh, like Oz Fan. I don't know, something like that. Okay. It's a fan of Oz. Uh, and so- There's an OnlyFans joke in there. <laughs> and so he, he just gave this little magazine, they published it, and that was the end of it for him. Like he didn't brag about it or anything. Yeah. It's just, that was the end. And then like 30 years later, a dude comes to him and he's like, do you realize that your book is one of the most popular to all these famous authors? Jesus Christ. It's Jim Thies. Yeah. Because it's terrible. Like it's the room in fantasy literature form. Right. And he just had no idea. And he, and he 
like as far as the interview goes, he doesn't seem to care. He's just like, okay, okay that's uh, well, good for you guys. I'm glad you enjoy it to some extent. <laughs> like he doesn't care. And that, that, that was pretty much the end of the story. There, there really wasn't much to the mystery. It was just a guy who has anonymity because he's nobody. He's not an author. He stopped after writing that one thing. So that, that's the perfect like cover to the whole thing is it, it just right. became urban myth because it was in this really niche magazine. Yeah. And only a couple people on, in the nation held on to a copy and then actually distributed the story. And it just grew from there. And it, it's, it's fascinating because it goes into depth about people trying to figure it out mm -hmm. because there was multiple versions of photocopies. So a photocopy, you would imagine, is the original publication. You would think. But if you photocopy another copy of something or if somebody else types it out from memory and then photocopies yeah, that. Exactly. So there's multiple photocopy versions and there was debate over which was actually the uh -huh. real one. And they found one that was a fake. I and believe it. The, it goes so like you should really read up on some of this because it goes into so much detail. That's interesting. And and everyone claimed to have known the person who had the original photocopy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it just it became this amazing thing. And it's only in the like around when this came out, uh, it people then knew about the Eye of Argon and it's now more mainstream. So if you go to fantasy conventions Odds are people know what it is and there may be some groups doing a reading of it or something like that. So okay. it's actually pretty well known now in fantasy circles. I, I never heard of it. Well, I mean, and I haven't either, but it, it kind of makes sense in a, in a way that with the rise in technology and the Internet and yeah, uh, yeah. things like that, that the, the blank edges of the map are being filled in, that the the world is getting smaller and mysteries like that were not not easy to solve, but easier Right. To solve if you know what you're doing and with the, the more technology we have. Yeah. Dissemination of information is so much easier. Exactly. So, so yeah, I, when I, I like I read the book and it was like, this is one of the worst fantasy novels ever. And I was like, eh, well, maybe. And then I started reading into it and I'm like, there's this whole mythos behind it. I'm like, this is cool. That's fascinating. That's yeah. very interesting. It's it's like that seldom happens anymore with like this, these urban legends yeah. of stuff like this. Like with the internet, there's like there's no such thing as an urban legend anymore. They call them creepy bosses now, but they're also obviously fake. I was I was thinking about the 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 entire time that you were talking about this this mythos and everything. I was thinking of the um, I don't remember the name, but it's like is it it might be Jim? It's like Jim drowned. Uh, ben drowned. Ben drowned. Ben drowned. Ben yep. the uh, the Majora's Mask creepy pasta. Yeah, and like it's <laughs> well, I mean, when I first read it, um, the person who wrote it out presented it very very well. So, and they had video clips and stuff. The, the band drowned. Right. Yes. Be because the person who created the creepypasta literally hacked the ROM and right. made the models contort and right. made fire appear out of nowhere. So it was like a little bit more, I want to say convincing, but it added so much flavor to it right. that it was really fun and like creepy. The, but the thing is, just don't play it. <laughs> Like, yeah, and that's, that's it's obviously not real because the, you just wouldn't play it. That's the solution here, right? With most, shall we say, harmless conspiracy theories, most of them can either be solved with a sticky note left on a fridge, right? Just like most movie plots, especially yeah. horror movie plots, or Reddit would have figured it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just don't do the thing. Yeah, no, it's it, it's very seldom you find just a harmless mystery like that anymore. Yeah. Where it's just the mystery of did this person exist? Right. Where did this come from? I don't know. It's it's so it's so fascinating. That's really really interesting. I love the the book itself. the 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 retelling of it. You know my my opinion of that book is yeah it's fine. But uh, but that whole section because and I knew there was something coming obviously because you kind of said at the beginning that there's essays about the book and everything which right. means that obviously people are talking about it for some reason. So I was looking for that reason throughout the whole the whole right. retelling. But no, that is that is not anything that I would have guessed. That's very interesting. Yeah. And like the I, I want to say that the I think it's badly written, but not from necessarily a, st a story standpoint. It's like it's it's mostly grammar, weird words, typos. Yeah, that's where the badness comes in. And that's where having. Like, that's where it's completely believable that it was a kid who was 16 who wrote into a magazine oh, instead yeah. of somebody who wrote in and had an editor and got it published. Right. And it, it was a fan magazine. So exactly. They're not professionals. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why it makes so much more sense. Yeah. So it's just the story itself is very, very, very simple. Not like I, I wouldn't say I was entertained at all. 
Um, but it was very easy to follow, very uh lots to talk about, I thought. It, it it was great. And I and I just love like the the cherry on top is just the guy doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. No, that's awesome. He's just like, well, yeah, whatever. I wrote it when I was 16. What do you expect? Yeah. Why do you care? <laughs> like, <laughs> and sadly, very sadly, he died at 48. So I think he, he died shortly after doing the interview with the one, oh. one guy. Well, at least they um, found him. But yeah. And in the 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 that's guy raised awareness because I guess he died of a heart condition and his family were like, we want to people to donate money to a sure, foundation sure. for heart health. And so the, the guy who put together this book, like raised a lot of money for that. Oh, that's cool. It was like, this guy wrote something that touched us all. And he went too soon. If you can donate money, it was like a whole wholesome thing. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I think it's very sad that he passed away before really seeing people on the internet enjoy. His right. Work. Right. Cause I mean, it had this hidden fame, but he didn't know about it except what this other random stranger told him. Right. And now it's like, it has a whole new life of its yeah. own, which he didn't get to see. So Do you, man, we could have had him on the show. We, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Seance? No, 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 no. We could have. Oh, if he was still alive. Yeah. I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have either, but we could have asked. We, we uh, maybe just Skype in, just say, how are you doing? Yeah. So yeah, that was the eye of, of Archon. That was a, that was a very, very interesting, interesting book. I'm very, very glad I know about it now. And it was, it was a quick, easy read. Fascinating. So at the end of every episode of this show, the person who read the book must give the book a rating. Our rating system consists of five levels. You have toilet paper which is the book is only worth the physical material it's made of. Shampoo bottle, where it's, you know, it's better than nothing. Ikea manual, which is competent but not entertaining. Uh, a Kindle pick, which is worth buying electronically and or discounted. And hardcover, which is it's an instant classic. It's a must own. So, Jesus Christ. Yes, my son. What is your rating for the Eye of Agamotto? Uh, this is absolutely a hardcover. I okay. think it's, it's like I'm so charmed by it. Like uh, after reading it, I was like, "Ugh, this is like shampoo bottle." Yeah, but the then, book itself is one thing. Yeah, the book itself, shampoo bottle, definitely. <laughs> but the the whole, I mean, I don't want to say, I want to say the short story is shampoo bottle. The book, which includes the essays and history right, and stuff, right? All that together is definitely hardcover. I love the history of the story and how people have enjoyed it over like the past fifty years. It's crazy. So absolutely worth buying this book. Yeah. Uh, the, the scholar's edition. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. I feel bad because my first hardcover was in a bonus episode that hasn't released yet. So this is my right. first hardcover. This is the first official hardcover. Of like the regular episodes. And this is, so this is the first hardcover. I mean, I wouldn't say so because we, we did the other ones. And we, I, did, we did the bonus episode hardcover. Yeah. But this is the first one that's being released. So on the show, I guess in the main feed, this is It's not the first in my heart though. Yeah. This is the third, technically. Yeah. Technically. But first official, I guess. Whatever. Yeah. But on that note, uh, it looks like this is this is a shorter episode. Yeah. This is an which, hour, which is refreshing. <laughs> it's it's absolutely refreshing. You're gonna have a breeze yes. <laughs> this week, which is awesome. Because we do, I mean, we have we have a, a schedule we stick to, and obviously we're recording this one late, so this is it's going to come out on time, but we have less time to work with than we usually do. I say we, I, I totally mean him. I don't edit any of this. <laughs> um, but if you want more content, check us out on our Patreon. Yeah. It's patreon.com slash a page too far. I think that's how you have to get there. I think if you just search for it, it won't I, show it because it's listed. I fucking tried to search for it and I couldn't. I think it's because it's listed as explicit. God damn it. That's so dumb. Yeah. That's yeah. dumb. So you have to go, you have to go patreon.com slash a page T-O-O far, a page too far. You'll be able to find us there. We have our first our first bonus episode uh, for July was three hours long. It was yeah, it was three hours long. It was, it was three hours long. long. Man. So if you want if you want more content, that's where you're going to see it this week. We're going to keep things a little bit shorter. Um, we are releasing another bonus episode for August. We'll do at least one a month. Um, we're mm -hmm. we're debating releasing the unrecorded episode on Patreon. We're I mean, eventually it's going to be released. It'll on be Patreon. released. It'll be. It'll go somewhere. But whether the timing on that, whether we do it for Halloween or something else, we'll right. We'll we're we're it still down. thinking about it. It is uh, to entice you. It is the most fucked up piece of literature either of us have ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> or read. Yeah. It. It is so fucked up. So if you really want to listen to something fucked up, just stay tuned. We'll we'll get it up eventually. We don't know exactly how to present it yet, but <laughs> it'll it'll go up. Yeah. There's there's definitely going to be extra disclaimers in front of it. Oh yeah. Um you you will not listen to it by accident 
No. Put it that way. Um, we also have uh, monthly outtakes because mm-hmm. not everything we record in the booth makes it to an episode. I can think of a few things I just said that are going to be cut. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, those go into our monthly outtakes. Every month we have five to ten minutes of just bonus content, just stuff that's plucked out of the episodes that may be funny, may be cringy. But it's up there for you guys. And in addition to all that, you also get episodes a day early uh, through right. Patreon. That's right. They come out Mondays at noon instead of Tuesdays Yeah, at noon. So uh, that's all that. Uh, reach out to us on the social medias. We have Instagram, yep. Twitter, of course, our email. Uh, we have Grindr. Um, just if you're in the Austin area. Yeah, <laughs> hit us up on Grindr. <laughs> Anything else? 